God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Uh, also, I want to make mention of, uh, on this particular subject, in more detail, Christians and politics. Ben preached some lessons on that back in February that you can listen to as well that are on our website. But also, there will be four different videos being released over these next few weeks that uh, have been put together by Ben and several of our men here uh, on this subject as well. Hopefully, those will be edifying to you. Let's uh, begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into our class. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessing of time that you've granted us. We thank you for the measure of health that we enjoy. We thank you so much for your revealed word. We ask, Father, you'd grant us wisdom and understanding. Grant us that we beg you to help us with, your, with understanding your word in a way that we can apply it and make proper use of it. God, we are so grateful that you have offered us salvation. We're thankful for our adoption as sons and daughters in your kingdom. We pray your blessing upon us now, in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to start off by reading uh, just the first four verses uh, of Hebrews chapter 12, and it reads here in the New King James Version, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Remember what came just before this. What proceeded in Hebrews 11 was this list, which included some descriptions of those who had been obedient in the faith, responding to God's will. The recipients of this letter were told in, in Hebrews chapter 2 they were drifting away. 5.11, they had become dull of hearing. In Hebrews 6.12, they had become sluggish. The Christians of the first century needed to be reminded that the endurance would be necessary to live the Christian life all the way to the end of their physical lives. And we need to be reminded of that as well. This is a race. It's going to require endurance. And we sometimes may drift become dull of hearing or become sluggish we've got to get back on course get back to running the race to whom are we told to look to as an example of running this race Jesus Christ he is the example we're looking to him for that example what are we told here in this passage to lay aside what are we told to lay aside every weight every weight every weight that would would hinder our race what else sin so we're to lay those things aside. Anything that keeps us from running the race with endurance, set it aside. Does that mean we may have to set aside things that may not inherently be wrong but are, in, are actually hindering us in running our race? Could Facebook be a problem? Could politics be a hindrance? Could uh, you know, temporal causes that we associate with distract us from accomplishing God's will in our life? Could those things weigh us down? Faithfulness to God requires that we lay aside every encumbrance, whatever it might be. Just as a runner knows that he, if he's carrying weights, he's not going to finish the race strong, is he? He's got to let those go. The race has got to be run. So some things are going to rid, some things are going to weigh us down, and we've got to put those aside. And particularly, of course, setting aside sin. That's definitely going to just throw us directly off course. Let's read Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. They're just, we're going to skim through a couple of things here. There's a, a two sections I really want to focus on, so forgive me for not allowing too many comments on these first two sections here. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. It reads, and, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Verse 5 here is, is quoted from Proverbs, 5, Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. 
And in this section, we're reminded that the exhortations delivered by God, by His Word, that demand we change, are intended for our good. And God may chasten us in other ways uh, through allowing us to endure trials or human suffering, and those things will perfect us, we're told in James 1, 2 through 4. But we are not called on to torment each other, cause pain for each other, wear each other down, or take the attitude of, I'm going to teach that person a lesson through hardship. That's not what this is talking about. Who's doing the chastening? God is doing the chastening. Uh, life provides plenty of those occasions for suffering, hardship, those things that come about. Uh, but if we listen to God's wisdom, then we'll be dis disciplined by His wisdom and we'll avoid a lot of the self-imposed consequences. Again, another reason to lay aside that sin uh, of our attention on today in Hebrews 12, 14. Hebrews 12, 14 through 15. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. So tell me, what does it mean to pursue peace with all people? We're told to do that. What does it mean? Yeah, right? Laying aside opinion. That could be a part of it. Laying aside opinions could be a, something that would be helpful to pursuing peace with someone. What else may it mean, Stu? Okay. Not having an attitude of being argumentative. Um, what else? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yes. So I want to read that passage, Romans 12, 16 through 19. Romans 12, 16 through 19. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So we must live in such a way that peace is possible, especially among brethren. And it's something that we should seek after. It says pursue peace. It doesn't just happen. We pursue it. We pursue peace. It takes work. It's not easy to have peace sometimes. What does it mean to pursue holiness? Yes. Okay, put aside fleshly things, sinful things. Be one that is following after God. You're set apart for His purposes. You're set apart for Him. You're a part of His kingdom, His family. So it means that we must, again, be spiritually minded. We have to behave and speak and practice those things that are godly and not carnal. It's something to be sought after. It also takes work. It doesn't just happen. You don't just wake up one day and go, hey, I'm living holy. It, you have to work at it, strive for it. These are vital because it says we will not see the Lord without pursuing them. That's how important these are. Pursuing peace, pursuing holiness, pursuing peace with all people. So what are the consequences to not pursuing peace with all people and holiness? We're told to be looking carefully and that we do not or lest anyone fall short of the glory of God, the grace of God, excuse me, essentially being lost. A root of bitterness springs up causing trouble. How might that happen? When people are not pursuing peace, there's something underneath that's waiting to spring because there's hurt feelings or difficulties and other things. It's a poison. You know, it's under the surface. It's going to spring up and cause problems. This is taken from a passage of Deuteronomy 29, I believe, in verse uh, 18 through 20. And this is a warning to the children of Israel. 
there, and it says in the last part of verse 18 of Deuteronomy 29, Beware lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. One who, when he hears the words of this sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. You see how that's not true? It's not true. The Lord will not be willing to forgive him, it says in verse 20. It's a serious thing. If someone's not pursuing peace with all brethren or pursuing holiness, there will be a root of bitterness that's going to spring up and cause trouble. Many may become defiled. How? Leading people away from following God's will or leading people towards following their own doctrine or their own opinions or other things. So how does this pursuit of peace and holiness apply to our behavior in a politically charged environment? such as we're living through right now. And by the way, this isn't the first time that Christians, even in our own country, have lived through politically charged environments. It it may be first for some of you, but it's not the first for this country and Christians who've lived here prior to us. I'd like to give you some, some suggestions on this. We must not make assumptions about each other that are not based on behavior. We must not make assumptions about each other that aren't based on behavior. What do I mean by that? There is not a political party that is a, quote, Christian party. All decisions we make regarding who we vote for should be based on what we believe in as the best interest of our country that would promote a place where we can live peacefully, live quiet lives, godly and dignified in every way. That is what we're told to pray for. In 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, and the ESV says, First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions. Why? That we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We must allow each other the liberty that's afforded us to cast our vote in this country. That's what we're given the right to do here. And it's not against God's will that we have the right to vote. For example, we should not assume that every person who votes for a certain candidate believes in everything that that candidate has ascribed to in their platform or that that person believes that person is a Christian. The person may not and most likely is not a Christian that you're voting for in, in many cases. If someone's casting a vote for a, a candidate, uh, it doesn't mean that they believe that everything that person's ever done has been moral or that everything that party stands for is moral. I've heard some say, or I should say write, because there's so much written out there, but when you write it on Facebook, it's public, and you said it. I said, excuse me, and, and I said it if I wrote it. So um, I've heard people say, I can't believe anyone who calls themselves a Christian would vote for, fill in the blank. Can't believe it. Can't believe anybody would vote for that guy, that woman. Voting for a political party candidate is not a litmus test for whether or not a candidate is a Christian or whether you are a Christian. You're voting for what you believe is in the best interest of the country. Are either of our major, major political parties in this country against divorce for any other cause but adultery? Are any of our parties against lying publicly? I, I think that those who are part of most of our major Uh, our two major parties have committed some of those things it's verifiable Uh, we must allow each other the liberty to legally petition the government regarding issues that are most important to each other it's not against the law to petition the government peacefully for things we must not condone or excuse sinful behavior to advance a cause that we believe in or that someone else holds dear We must not elevate our citizenship in our country over our citizenship in the kingdom of God. Let me give an example of this. You know, the First Amendment of the Constitution allows free speech. And it says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Does this give the Christian the right to say anything they want without any consequence? Of course not. 
I am bound by a higher standard. I am bound by a higher law because I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. I can't say just anything that I want to say. We're bound to control our tongue, to control ourselves. We cannot excuse that behavior because the government grants us the right to do it. Christians are to be first citizens in the kingdom of God, and a political party affiliation should never rise above this as all political parties are man-made. They're man-made parties, and they could promote something or not stand for something that's right. We must as Christians avoid all the appearance of evil and, you, and not use our liberty as a cloak for malice, but to live peaceable lives. We're to pursue peace. Part of me pursuing peace is obeying these commands. If, let's look at 1 Peter 2.13. 1 Peter 2.13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God. Let that sink in a minute. For this is the will of God that we do that that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Christians were to honor the emperor. They didn't have any say-so in who the emperor was going to be. We're privileged to live in a country where we actually have a say-so. We can vote. We can, we can air grievances. This is a huge blessing. Yet, we don't want to use those freedoms as a cover for sinning. We don't want to participate in things that would be sinful under the guise of, I have the freedom because the country has granted me this. So the question we should answer for ourselves is, what we, is what we say and how we behave pursuing peace with all people you have to answer that for yourself is what we say and i'm going to say what i say and what i how i behave is it promoting and this pursuit of peace with all people is what i say and how i behave pursuing holiness am i truly setting aside sin like i'm supposed to be any, uh, any comments or, or questions about anything that's been said to this point? Anything you want to interject? Yes. In areas of opinion, absolutely. Yeah, that's what you're focused on. So setting aside our opinions, maybe not vocalizing everything that we think on a matter, that's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? Don't you have an opinion on most things? I mean, you have your you, way you'd like to think about something. So uh, it's not that we have to air all those out all the time. Christians are to first be this, this citizen of the kingdom. Uh, let's look at Hebrews 12, 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted it to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. You see, Esau couldn't undo the damage he had done. And there are things that we do that have consequences that just can't be undone. We might be able to be forgiven of them, but the consequence is there. It says here, uh, there's some commentary about the fornicator, whether that intends to imply that he was more of an idolater or truly committed fornication. 
Um, but I, f- I do find it interesting in Genesis 26, verse 34, when Esau was 40 years old, he took two wives of the Hittites, and it says, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. Uh, sad, sad commentary. But some of, some of these transactions that we engage in, just like um, Esau had done in a profane way, uh, really are, are not able to be undone. And Esau wanted it to be undone. He begged and pleaded, but it couldn't happen. I can't help but imagine that hell will be filled with those who have changed their mind. Think about that. But they have no, no way of changing the decisions they've made. Some consequences cannot be undone. In Hebrews twelve eighteen, for you have not come to, and remember this phrase, for you have not come to this, the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and, and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. So terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. This section, if you'll remember, is uh, recounting when God spoke to the children of Israel at, the Mount, at Mount Sinai. They were prevented from touching even the mountain that uh, you know, Moses was to ascend. And even an animal were to go in that area. It was be put to death. The God who struck fear in their hearts with that enormous power and that visual display, auditory display, is the same God that we serve. He is the same God. He has the same amount of power. But we're now under a new covenant where Jesus is our mediator. But just because God is not displaying his power like that today doesn't mean that he has any less of it. Look at this phrase here in verse 22. Instead of, but you have not come, he says what we have come to. But you have come to, what? Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. It's a spiritual. To an innumerable company of angels, spiritual. The general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. To God, the judge of all, the spirits of just men made perfect, the to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. <clears throat> this is impressive. In contrast to those physical manifestations of God's power, we have a very different set of circumstances, don't we? But we're dealing with the same God. We're citizens of a kingdom that will never be shaken will never be destroyed we are in the church while we're alive so we're on these heavenly roles it continues in verse 25 see that you do not refuse him who speaks for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven whose voice then shook the earth but now he has promised saying yet once more i shake not only the earth but also heaven Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken will remain. You see, the United States of America can be shaken and it can be destroyed. Eventually it will be when the Lord returns. We should not put our faith in things that are temporal, but in that which cannot be taken away. We're in a spiritual kingdom that will never be shaken that will never be destroyed. We're already in it. We're his people. We're still residing here in the flesh, but we're saved. Our soul is residing here in our body, and it it is saved. Hebrews 12, verse 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace, by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Since we are citizens in this kingdom, what ought that to yield in us? What should it yield? You tell me. Spirit of service. Spirit of service. Why would we have to be motivated? Because this grace, this gratefulness, that's really the sense of this. We're thankful. We're overwhelmed with what we've been given that we want to serve acceptably. God with reverence and godly fear. 
What are some of the things we have to be thankful for in the spiritual kingdom that we're a part of? What are you thankful for in this kingdom? You're in it. What are you thankful for? Forgiveness. Wow, forgiveness. We can let our guilt, it's gone. Our guilt can be relieved. We don't have that burden to carry. What else? What's that? Mercy. We've received mercy. We didn't deserve what we got. We deserved punishment, but we received mercy instead. What else are you thankful for in this great kingdom that we're in? Hunter? Grace. Grace for in itself, in the other sense of the word. We received that gift we didn't earn. What else are you thankful for? So our citizenship cannot be taken away from us through a, an election, <laughs> a vote. Th this country, if it, if it ever fails, it will not remove me from the kingdom of God. There are lots of Christians who live in other nations, even today, right? Lots. So we have to keep things in perspective. What does this make you thankful for in each other? We're looking at people in the eyes. We don't see their whole faces anymore, but we look them in the eyes, and we, we see people that are on those heavenly roles with us. How much should we value those? Jesus gave his blood to save me and you. If his blood was worth you, aren't you worth the time it takes to pursue peace with you? Aren't you worth the time it takes to set aside sinful behaviors towards another? You are worth it. God has made us worth it. And God has demanded it of us. So I plead with you to stay focused. Stay focused on the things which are eternal. The kingdom that we're a part of that's eternal. Stay focused on those things. Let's stay focused on serving God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Remember, God is still a consuming fire, it says. He will judge us through Jesus in the end. And He will vindicate not me. He will, and neither will you. He will vindicate. That's our lesson for today. I really appreciate your kind attention. We have about one more minute left, and I want to encourage you to pick up a classroom book uh, called Kingdom Leaders. It's on the table there in the foyer for next week. Study lessons one and two. The lessons are fairly easy to go through. Uh, we're going to be covering two of those lessons each week. Uh, the elders, Tim, Jimmy, and myself, are going to be rotating the teaching schedule in that class. And this is something that we have gone through together as just the shepherds. We've gone through this material before in a class we offered to the deacons, and we're going to be going through this material again we, with you all in attempts that we can all learn from it and be better, um, both uh, in our role and understanding our role, but also just as, as becoming leaders in God's kingdom uh, for his congregations. Really appreciate your help today. Thank you for your comments. Uh, we'll be dismissed for a couple of minutes.